church, the creation of the church not just for its own purposes, but to make Christ known. And the church starts out in a big way. It doesn't go out gradually from Jerusalem. It goes out with power and with comprehensiveness. If you pull up Google map of the countries or peoples represented at Pentecost in this passage, you would see literally a whole circle of every region going out from Jerusalem, literally north and south and east and west and everything in between was represented by that gathering in Pentecost. And we know that they went home to tell of those stories, the wonder of the, uh, of the, of the good news of Jesus Christ. And from that, the church was born. And with that birth of the church comes the wonderful, unexpected, mystical truth that we suddenly have family. Not family of blood, but family by spirit. It is an amazing thing to be able to interface with the reality that with the church around the world, we are family. And I would like to think that for each of us, there is a wonderful sort of joy that comes in discovering family that we may not know that we have. And I'm going to tell a personal story from this, although I'm missing there, from this picture right here, of my own discovery of family that I didn't know that I had that has had a great deal of meaning in my life. And this is actually family that I inherited because of my husband. My husband's great aunt Betty was a medical nurse, a missionary to China in the 1920s. Great Aunt Betty's story was not well put together by Mark's family, but I inherited the photos that she took, letters that she wrote. Thankfully, there were family members that had saved some of those letters that Aunt Betty wrote from China. The picture that you see of her here, by the way, was taken in 1915 when she graduated from the School of Nursing at the University of Michigan. They didn't even have a degree program for nursing at that time. She graduated with a certificate of nursing. And because I never had the privilege of actually meeting Aunt Betty, I have so many questions to ask of her when we meet up in heaven. One of the main ones being, what in the world motivated you in 1915 to get on a steamer ship up here in the Northwest, by the way, and make your way to China in the 1920s. It must have absolutely bamboozled her Dutch Christian Reformed family, which is the background that Keith and I came with. I mean, it frightens people enough that I go where I go, but I go on Delta, usually in comfort economy, and that's a whole different experience. But the discovery of Aunt Betty's faith and faithfulness and the little bits of letters and stories that she would write once she came back and would, would author letters for missionary journals just absolutely has blown me away, not only to the extent that she is kind of a, an encouragement, kind of a role model for me, but to see in her heart a clarion call to follow Christ despite all of the odds against her. I am so grateful for this family that I didn't know that I had. Well, over our brief time together, I want to introduce you to some family that you probably don't know that you have. And in doing so, I hope that you will not only be encouraged by that, but also to be perhaps inspired by the work and witness of family in places that you may not yet have known that we have family there and to know them by name. And I start with this young couple that you see here, Mirdad and his wife, Ferouge, who are Presbyterians from Iran. 
Does that surprise you to know there are Presbyterians in Iran? It shouldn't if you go back to our passage today because that litany of countries represented begins with three places that are all in Iran today. The Parthians, the Medes, and the Elamites are all places in now the modern country of Iran. Why should we be surprised that the church was planted there? Mirdad, by the way, was not born a Presbyterian. He was born a Muslim. He came to faith in Jesus Christ in the way that many Iranians do, and that is through dreams and visions, because that is what the way the Spirit works in places where there is not a well-established church. Mirdad's story was an inspirational one as I met him for the first time at a, an equipping conference in Lebanon to learn of not, not only how he came to faith in Christ, but how he would give leadership to the church in Iran that I was able to visit and walked into a church in Iran that was filled almost completely with Muslim converts to Christianity. The government would shut that down eventually, but that church would go underground, and today the church, the evangelical church in Iran is one of the fastest growing Christian churches anywhere in the world today in Iran, the things that we don't know about how our family, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is making Christ known, our family of faith. I want to introduce you to another member of the family of faith that you may not know. His name is Joseph Lewis. And Joseph is a Presbyterian pastor in Egypt. Lori made reference to some of the stories I've told about the vitality of church planting in Egypt today. By the way, our Presbyterian family there numbers about 400,000. That's quite a few Presbyterians in a place where Christians are a minority of the country. And yet that Presbyterian family that we can be proud of to know is deeply dedicated to making Christ known. The church, by the way, Presbyterian Church, has been there since the late 1800s when Presbyterian missionaries first went there. The missionaries have long gone because the church itself is mature. It is training its own leaders. It is doing its own work and witness, its mission and ministry. And Joseph Lewis is a good example of that. I met him first when he was a student at the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo and began to learn about his story. One of the things that's very noticeable, two things noticeable about Joseph is this big effervescent smile that never seems to leave his faith, face, and the other thing is that he walks with a very pronounced limp. And I would soon learn Joseph's story, how as a young man he was on a crowded train going from his home down in southern Egypt up to Cairo when somewhere along the way he fell off the train because of the crowding. He was run over by the train and he lost his leg. Because he came from a poor family, they did not have access to medical care. Joseph made his own prosthetic leg and eventually would make his way to seminary in Cairo. After seminary, he was ordained and, and, and um, sent to a church in one of the poor suburbs of Cairo where he served for a number of years, and now he has been called to the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo, the Presbyterian Seminary, to be a professor, very appropriately, of pastoral care of someone who can speak to people who have been hurt, who have gone through difficult circumstances. Joseph Lewis, part of your family that you did not know that you had. Followed here by this wonderful woman, an elder from the Presbyterian Church in Cuba. Lori mentioned that I have responsibility for the work of the Outreach Foundation in the Middle East. I also have responsibility for the church in Cuba, which is a great delight. And as I kind of say a little bit kind of offsides with a bit of irony, it's one of the few places I get to go that are not at war from time to time, although Cuba has its own problems and actually is on a long projected war with the United States through these deep political divides that separate us, but they cannot separate 
separate family. And so since 2020, no, since 2000, I should say, I've been traveling to Cuba, bringing others with me to meet our Presbyterian family. And Mercedes Cardenas, who you see here, is a remarkable Presbyterian elder who I would meet from time to time in the small village of Sabania. She is now well in her 90s. She is still going strong. She's a retired teacher, by the way, an English teacher. Rail thin with these thick glasses that exudes joy to welcome you to her village, to her church, to be part of her family. Mercedes came to faith back in the 1920s, as she talks about, 1930s, when, when evangelists first came to her village. A church was born. She became part of that. She talks about its thriving nature when suddenly, with the coming of the communist revolution, everything changed, and almost every Christian in town left. And for about 30 years, Mercedes was the church in Cardenas, until in the 1980s, the church began to reconstitute itself. And now a small church was built in her village. She said, we named it the Resurrection Church because we came out of the ashes. This is the work and witness of our family of faith in a place like Cuba. One of my most recent trips was to Iraq. Um, and this happened very, very recently. In fact, on May the 13th, just a few weeks ago, I was in the city of Mosul, which is where this picture is taken. I am standing in the restored church, the Presbyterian church in Mosul, that was built in 1840 over the door of that church on the street, there is written in English, the Protestant church, which seems like a, a bit of pretension to call yourself the Protestant church, except in 1840, it was the only Protestant church in all of Iraq. A church with an incredible history in a city, in a place that has been hard pressed but not crushed. Mosul is one of those places that most people remember from terrible stories upon the news. The, the history of Mosul in Iraq, which goes back, kind of comes into our public knowledge right after 2003 with the war that the Americans brought down Saddam Hussein, but into the vacuum of power that was created in Iraq after that. Almost every terrorist organization in the region moved in. Mosul was soon destabilized by Al-Qaeda, huge pressure put upon Christians in that place, and Mosul at that time, by the way, had more Christians per capita than any other place in Iraq. Following Al-Qaeda, ISIS would take control of Mosul and would declare it its capital in Iraq. And in July of, or June of 2014, ISIS began to expunge the last remaining Christians in Mosul, three of whom were these sisters that you see in this picture, the El Saka sisters standing with me from left to right, Nadira and Mary and Hana El Saka. That church in Mosul was badly damaged, not only through its occupation by ISIS, who took it over as they did in almost every Christian space to desecrate it, but then through the battle to reclaim, uh, to reclaim Mosul in 2016, all of this area around the church was hammered, literally into piles of rubble. In 2019, I went back with a team from the Outreach Foundation and with our local Presbyterians there taking us by the hand, as I've described before, to see what remained of the church. And all of us were surprised to find that although badly damaged, it was not destroyed. And so we asked the church, is it your call? Do you think God is calling you to rebuild this, to reconstitute this witness, knowing there was not one single Christian left in the city of Mosul at that time? They prayed, they discerned, they said, 
we think God is calling us to reconstitute this church. And so Outreach Foundation, through partner churches around the country, provided resources to rebuild that church. And on May the 13th, that picture was taken as we returned to Mosul to stand in that restored sanctuary to celebrate Holy Communion, the great family banquet that we will celebrate and to say God is still at work in this place through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is our family, the Alsaka sisters. Now they are your family. And the last family member that I will introduce you to is this beautiful young woman whose name is Mathilde, or Matty for short, Mathilde Sabah. She is one of the youngest Presbyterian pastors serving in Syria. She is also the most recently ordained pastor and the first woman ever ordained in Syria. The first woman ordained in Syria, this young woman, your family, your cousin now, Mathilde. I've known Mathilde for a very, very long time. I met her when she was a university student attending a, a conference for young people in Syria that had been brought together through some of the 20 Presbyterian churches that make up our family of faith in Syria. And Mathilde at that time was finishing her degree in English literature, so she spoke, spoke fluent English. I met her with her brother Jake, Yakub, who had just graduated from seminary and was on his way to be ordained into a church, and Mathilde said, I want to follow my brother to seminary, which she did. She followed her brother to seminary, and about that time, the war broke out in Syria, and as she completed her seminary degree, the Synod of Syria, Lebanon, her, the, you know, the, the Assembly of Presbyterian Churches said, we don't think it's a good idea for you to be sent back to Syria in the midst of the war, and Mathilde said, au contraire, this is exactly when I need to be sent back to Syria. And she was because she went to serve her own home congregation of Hasake up in the far northeast corner of Syria, far from any other church. This beautiful young woman went to serve against all odds. She is still there serving that church since returning home. Thanks be to God, um, a wonderful young man was brought into her life, Isa. They married, they have two young daughters in this far remote region of Syria where now this newly ordained young woman is building the church, growing the church, 15 families, but on, Sunday, on Friday morning when Sunday school happens, there are 200 children in that sanctuary. In a, in a church of only 15 families, she is re preaching the gospel to her community. They are flocking to sit at the feet of this young woman, Mathilde, and to see her face, to meet her, you may understand why that is. There is a power and a passion that comes not from her, but from the Holy Spirit. Be proud to know her as family. Lori was kind to mention the fact that Outreach Foundation presented to this church the possibility to partner in one specific project in Syria that is rebuilding the church, helping it to re-equip itself. The Aleppo Christian Center is going to be one of those places for theological education and reflection so that Syrians don't have to leave the country to find that kind of equipping. They can do it in-house, and it will serve people like the next generation of Mati Sabah's family that we can be proud of, family that we can be encouraged by. When my husband of 44 years, Mark, and I um, lived in Houston, Texas, where we did for 21 years, I served on the staff of First Presbyterian Church Houston there, by the way, but when we first moved there, so some of our first family, some of our first friends became Al and Anita DuPont. They were members of First Presbyterian Church. Al was in the choir as we were, an important part of our um, church life is singing in the choir. Al was a, a career um, 
uh, engineer at NASA, a brainiac of the highest order, but his wife, Anita, was this expansive, welcoming woman for whom her house was never without visitors, as far as we could tell. We spent a lot of time in the house of Anita and Alan because we ended up first renting an apartment in the same building where they were. And we were invited to gathering after gathering after gathering, and we were always amazed by whenever we would go to the DuPont's house for coffee or a glass of wine or a dinner, there would be many people that we knew, that we had met, that were members of First Pres, Houston, but then there would also be strangers, someone that she had met or an acquaintance of someone else, there was always room at the table for someone at the home of Anita DuPont. And one time Mark and I reflected upon that fact, kind of the wonder of that, that there was always room at her table for strangers. And Anita just kind of smiled a little bit and we'll never forget what she said to us. She said, you know, I, f I think there are only two kinds of people, family and family we have not yet met. And I thought, that will preach. That is actually the message of Pentecost, the family we know and the family we have not met, the global family that is the church who are on the front line of making Christ known. How wonderful that they invite us to come alongside them in their work and witness, to encourage them to be humbled by their faithfulness and their perseverance, but through that power of the Spirit to unite in the one mission of the church, which is to make Christ known till every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord because he is. Thanks be to God.